Welcome, spiritual warriors, to our study, discussion, spiritual warriorship class. What do we do here? We read and study and make comments, ask questions from the books of His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami Maharaj, who if in his body would be 61 years old today. Um, it seems when um, sannyasis go out of their, leave their body, they are then their celebration of appearance and disappearance is based on the Vaishnav calendar rather than the Western calendar. So some of us are, most of us are his disciples, I'm sure, remembering him in our hearts and being thankful for having had his association and being under his shelter. And we still are under his shelter because he told us when he was out of the body, he would be more with us than when he was in the body. So for those, if any are watching who are celebrating, I think in D.C. they're having their celebration tonight. Even Nagri, they'll be doing it. March 13th is the Vedic calendar date um, for celebrating his appearance. We'll be doing that here in Lachua and uh, other places. So, by his mercy, and if you see me look up, I've got a big picture of him on my wall right here and sometimes when I think I get a little stuck I just look up and ask for his help and mercy. So how are you? How has your week been? We are in Spiritual Warrior, the book Spiritual Warrior 5, Chapter 5 titled, The Need for Constant Mindfulness. Those of you who were with us, we began this chapter last week, and those who were with us, how was your week? Mindful? I tell you, I found from the next morning, this, this, this concept, this principle, was very strong in my mind. And it made my next day quite interesting. I'd say my next two days, or three days. But the first day was really still holding on to what I had read here and the desire to get in that state of knowing, seeing Krishna and everything. And it was just amazing. It isn't that I did anything different. Well, in a way, I did, because it seemed I got things done that needed to be done, and I had planned to do them, but in a more mindful way of how I was getting it done and how it was happening. I don't know if that makes sense, but it made sense to me. So I'm hoping when we read and we hear these concepts, principles, instructions, of Bhakti Tirta Swami, we put them to practice in our lives because it's all about helping us, pushing us to be spiritual warriors and to know who we are. So I don't want to review it all, although I tell you, when I started reading, it was like, oh my gosh, I didn't remember that. I wonder if those who were there heard it, and of course, if you weren't here, then you missed it. But if you have a Spiritual Warrior 5 book, please go to Chapter 5 and catch up. If you don't have, and you do want, we tell you, Krishna.com store, or online, www.harinamapress.com. Org. I think that's it. Yeah. And you and there, as I said, on Harinama Press, you can see all the books 
you can even read excerpts from them. Okay? So, the need for constant mindfulness. Now, what I notice in this chapter, he gives us a number of Bhagavad Gita verses to, uh, again, help us become more mindful of how the Lord is in our lives and how he tells us because Bhagavad Gita is the Lord himself speaking to us to get an understanding of who he is. So what I want to suggest, as you hear, try to make note of the Bhagavad Gita verse I will be quoting. He will have in the book and I will read. And take time to get out your Bhagavad Gita and go to that verse, read it again and read the purport. Okay? And this is like a study. Make it a study week. And make notes and see how your life is improving or how you're becoming... Um, how you are developing a deeper relationship with the Supreme Personality Godhead, the Absolute Truth, Krishna. Okay? That's your assignment. Bhagavad Gita purports as given by Bhakti Tirtha Swami in this book. How's that? And we'll start tonight's class quoting from Bhagavad Gita 6.26, which says, From wherever the mind wanders due to its flickering and unsteady nature, one must certainly withdraw it and bring it back under the control of the self. Now, as I said, Bhagavad Gita 626, first one quoted, please try to make time to read that and the purport and see how it fits into your spiritual life because that's what it's all about. I'm, okay, just let me go with it. I'm going to go with, go with, they say go with the flow. I'm not going to read all we read last week, but the practice of mindfulness enables us to perceive the essence of all things. Every entity and element has its dharma or essential nature. But the ultimate essence of everything is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Furthermore, the Godhead is so mystically creative, cleverly subtle, and extraordinarily diverse that recognizing and honoring him at every moment requires great mindfulness. And we have in our scriptures always remember God, never forget God. And it's like Bhakti Tirtha Swami is going to encourage us towards that and how to do that. Now, in other words, mindfulness means to constantly see Krishna or God in everything at all times. Yeah, all times. It involves the recognition of God right to be what he wants, when he wants, and interact with us as he likes. Once the Supreme Lord takes personal interest in our lives, he also reserves the rights 
to teach or benefit us through hard knocks or through gentle means. It's personal. Krishna is a person. On our part, we must remember to mindfully see his hand operating at all times. Not only when we practice the rituals or associate with spiritual people, but constantly, unceasingly. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, that mind is always active. It is always thinking about something. And when we give that something attention, it just gives us more of that something until you get sick and tired. And I'm like, where did that? Sometimes I say, where did that come from? But if you're mindful, when it starts bringing that nonsense, you can say, uh-uh. No, you're not coming in with that now. And you can go back to picking up your Bhagavad Gita. You can go back to chanting the holy name. Or you can go even to thinking about a pastime or the form of the Lord or Radharani. The challenge, the challenge involved, is to remain fixed in mindfulness of God always and then function in ways that will constantly enhance our vision of him. In this way, we can gradually begin to sustain a state of samadhi or spiritual trance, regardless of external environment. Now that's a mouthful. That's just opening this chapter. <laughs> and then he tells us that as the advertisers increase the hype about sense gratification and the many fantasies of utopia, more people will find it impossible to endure the level of disappointment that life will dish out to them unless they start to perceive spiritual phenomenon and tangible confirmation of the existence of God. So those of us that are reading Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, associating with the Bodhi, hearing these programs, are in a wonderful position, fortunate position, because you're, you're recognizing there is God and His name and form and pastimes. And the more you hear and the more you study and the more you talk about it, it begins to seep in to your system, your psyche. People are unable to go beyond mere re religiosity and bathe in spiritual people who are unable to go beyond mere religiosity and bathe in spirituality will fail to make a deep spiritual connection. Okay, we want to focus on how to see God everywhere. And Krishna himself tells us in the Bhagavad Gita 10.10, 10, that's another purport you're going to study, right? Read through. Don't let the word study turn you off. It's a process that we're in, a spiritual process. Bhagavad Gita 10.10, 10. some of you may even know this in Sanskrit, but I'll spare your ears and just read the English for now. To those who are constantly devoted to serving me with love, 
I give the understanding by which they can come to me. Okay? That's a wonderful verse. Now, he mentioned several times in Spiritual Warrior 4, and in this book, Krishna advises his devotees to fully absorb themselves in his worship. And we know Bhagavad Gita 9.34. Man mano bhava man bhakto. You know that one, right? What the instructions are so clear. Engage your mind always in thinking of me. Become my devotee. Offer obeisances unto me and worship me. Can't be clearer than that, huh? Being completely absorbed in me, surely you will come to me. Now, if he's the cause, you're the very best friend, you well wish it, and here he's telling you how to come to him. Krishna, who is God himself, tells us to think of him constantly. God is an infallible source whose advice is much more important than the advice of consultants, coaches, or other resourceful materials. Krishna actually tells us which thoughts and ideas should occupy our mind. However, after receiving such valid instructions, how does a person execute them? How is it possible to always remain God conscious and always think of the Lord? Although a seemingly improbable goal this constant remembrance of God is ultimately the essence of spiritual life. When we develop the ability to always think about the Supreme Personality of Godhead along with His name, form, pastimes, activities, servants, and messages of love, then we will gradually enter into the Lord's arena. And in many cases, we will quickly come to a point of directly experiencing God's blessings. All that auspiciousness arises from the mere act of simply reflecting on God, particularly when action follows that contemplation. Okay? I'm going to give you two more Bhagavad Gita. He gives us Bhagavad Gita 7.7. 7. We went through these last week, so I'm just bringing them to Bhagavad Gita 7.10. Okay. We want to develop continual mindfulness so that we can experience and interact more with God at every moment. When we develop proper mindfulness, even our external circumstances will no longer matter because we will have dovetailed our consciousness with God and develop cognizance of Him even at work, at home, or on the street. It becomes a habit. 
and in Bhagavad Gita 7.6 he states, Krishna states, all created beings have their source in these two natures. Of all that is material, that's one, and all that is spiritual, that's the second, in this world. Know for certain that I am both the origin and dissolution. So here he's reminding us that mindfulness again means experiencing God everywhere. See everything as a manifestation of Him. And see everything in Him. Now it also means positioning ourselves to receive and experience God's blessings and auspicious energies in our day-to-day -day functions as we eat, drink, sleep, mate, and defend, we can see all things in relation to Krishna by remembering his words. And what are those words? Oh, son of Kunti, I am the taste of water, the light of the sun and the moon, the syllable Om in the Vedic mantras. I am the sound in ether and ability in man. Now, that's Bhagavad Gita 7-8. So, this was where we left off last week, so we'll continue with these and a few more Bhagavad Gita verses. Krishna gives us many opportunities to remember him. And sometimes he has to bash us to get us to do it. But just in everyday life, when we observe the sun moving in space, we can immediately reflect on this fiery planet as the eye of God. This simple conception of Krishna's presence can accompany us in our daily dealings and even provide comfort if we act properly. Why? Because we know that God sees all our efforts to befriend and obey him. Like um, Bhakti Chitra Swami had an expression, God does not take a vacation. So we can't hide from him. He's always there. And he's always mindful and seeing and hearing. And he's right in our heart, so we can't even whisper or something and think something inside that he doesn't already know. Most importantly, all of these representations are expressions of God's love for us. Krishna radiates his love in the form of sunshine, which heals, purifies, soothes, and illuminates. If we can remember this fact and allow that thought to permeate throughout our consciousness, then our love of the Supreme will naturally grow without impediments. Why? Because we feel intense gratitude for his provisions and protections. Remember we went through a whole class on an attitude of gratitude. You have someone nearby or in your family and you give them something and you're sharing with them. You gotta like it if they say thank you. Oh, that was so nice. 
Thank you very much. So once we enter into this frame of mind, we will find it easier to follow the recommendations of the Vedic scriptures by giving rapt oral reception to the words of God, which are both edifying and pacifying. Hearing, hearing, hearing. When Krishna says, I am the light of the sun and the moon and the symbol Om in the Vedic mantras. I am the sound and ether and ability in man. We can recognize his presence more fully minute by minute while appreciating the various abilities in man or woman, we can recognize the Supreme as the source of those talents. Actually, whenever we witness some great achievement, ability, attribute, or beauty, instead of allowing the temporary possessor of that gift to distract us, we can remember the Lord who possesses these brilliant qualities in full. Wouldn't be there if it didn't come from Him. We can also remember His extreme generosity and magnanimity in sharing them so liberally with others. Anybody in the chat room? Carol. Yeah, Carol. Carol? Mm -hmm. Oh, bless her heart. Welcome, Carol. Furthermore, the act of dispensing these charities to his children, friends, and lovers never depletes or lessens him in any way. And here he quotes Krishna again. He's really making us mindful of what Krishna has given us in instructions and how we're to live by it. He's quoting now, Krishna says, Know that all opulent, beautiful, and glorious creations spring from but a spark of my splendor. But what need is there, Arjun, for all this detailed knowledge? With a simple fragment of myself, I pervade and support the entire universe. Now that's Bhagavad Gita, chapter 10, Text 41 to 42. Do try to read the purport of Prabhupada. So, Bhakti Chaitanya Swami tells us that when we function with a mindful consciousness during our daily duties at home or at work, which may seem quite tedious and unfulfilling, such duties can take on a whole different perspective because we see them in relationship to some aspect of the Creator. And that's not so difficult to do if you've gotten the other points that were brought up. Those of us who are captivated by the wonderful aroma of various sense can relish the Lord in this form. And here he quotes again from Bhagavad Gita 7.9. Krishna says, I am the original fragrance of the earth and I am the heat in fire. I am the life of all that lives and I am the penances of all aesthetics. 
Now, even the sense of smell can help us reflect on an energy or aspect of God. Everything has some fragrance, smell, or emanation. And the earth itself has an original fragrance. This verse describes the Dharma or essence of certain objects such as the heat of fire and the fragrance of the earth. The essential nature or purpose of all things always leads us back to the Lord. And here's another Bhagavad Gita verse he tells us. 7.10 Another purport to read. He states, Krishna states, O son of prophet, know that I am the original seed of all existences. The intelligence of the intelligence and the powers of all powerful men. Throughout the world, we see great exhibitions of power and intelligence. <clears throat> but for clarification, the scriptures tell us that Krishna is the one supreme source of all these opulences. What does it say? Krishna to Bhagavan Swayam. God is the fountainhead of all incarnations, expansions, and entities. Throughout the creation, people constantly seek wealth, knowledge, beauty, renunciation, fame, and strength. But when they reach their goal, they soon find another person who has an even greater stock of these opulences. And they have this write-up, I don't know, once a year, the top so many wealthiest men and women in the, I don't know, I guess in the United States. I don't know if it's the world. I don't pay too much attention right now. But the next year, there's some different people who are the richest, the wealthiest in the world. So it'll always be someone else. However, in spite of this competition, and how about the beauty contest, huh? Every year, somebody shows it out over somebody else. More beautiful, they say. In spite of this competition, there's someone who has all these qualities in full and who no one else can outperform. We can also appreciate the Godhead as the one who has the greatest opulences and qualities. His strengths, fame, beauty, wealth, knowledge, and renunciation far surpass those of any other entity in existence. So as we reflect on certain aspects of the greatness of creation, we can then relate those aspects to the ultimate creator. When we see different shaktis or enemy energies, we should understand that they all come from the Saktiman or the original energetic. Is he giving us information to think about? It isn't that it's new information if we've been studying reading books and going to classes, but he's bringing it all together in a 
help us to reach a state of complete mindfulness so that as we function every day, we don't have to wonder, oh my God, what's going on? It's like, oh, okay, I see what's happening. You're seeing the essence. Now he quotes from Bhagavad Gita 7.11 and 7.12. Hope you're writing these down. Hope you'll be able to read these purports. They're really beautiful. I went there today and um, I say no. I'm not going to make notes on those purports. I'm going to let that be your assignment. Because it's to open our hearts and to make us more connected. 711, Krishna says, I am the strength of the strong, devoid of passion and desire. I am sex life, which is not contrary to religious principles. And 712, he says, Know that all states of being, be they goodness, passion, or ignorance, are manifested by my energy. I am, in one sense, everything. But I'm independent. I am not under the modes of material nature, for they, on the contrary, are within me. Bhagavad Gita 7.12 Well, oh, this is great. We'll have time. The Lord clearly says that everything comes from Him. However, He still remains independent and outside his own creation. This is the transcendental aspect of Godhead. Now, I, I don't know if you can tell, enjoy reading that. <laughs> it, it, it's just again a reminder and refreshing that which we have been studying or if we've taken initiation, reminder, or if we're thinking of it, to really know who is in control, who is making all the arrangements, and who is always present. So he's going on now. He says he wants to share a meditation from, he has uh, his beggar book. This is Beggar 2. I think there are four beggar books he wrote also, beautiful meditations. And this meditation is entitled, Well Done, My Darling, Well Done. Now, in order to help us take the mindfulness much further, in order to help us take this mindfulness much more to heart, to bring us closer to it, we want to connect more with the transcendental so that the increasing degradation and duality in the material societies will not disturb us to the same extent. Yes, it's going to go on. But when you have you know you're connected with the Lord in the heart because he says he's in everybody's heart when you are constantly thinking of him and seeing him in everything and functioning in your your activity with this understanding you don't get so disturbed mindfulness is a serious weapon that we want to share with you, he says, for healthy spiritual survival and even for material stability. Now, in this prayer, the individual endeavors to practice mindfulness and then receives great reciprocation and encouragement from the Beloved. When people who we deeply care about act in a beneficial way, 
we want them to recognize their own achievements. We feel happy that they have enhanced their existence through their actions, which in turn helps us to participate in their victory. If we do not care about a person, we may, e not, we may not even notice their outstanding behavior, and we feel hesitant to express any kind of appreciation. However, when we care, we feel happy that their actions will ultimately enhance their own well-being. We feel some satisfaction knowing that their behavior will have a beneficial result. So here is the first um, part of the meditation. Today I practice mindful breathing. As I inhale, I imagine drawing in love serenity, knowledge, and bliss. As I exhaled, I imagined releasing lust, anger, fear, and sadness. When I entered the temple, I looked at your picture. I saw you smile at me and say, well done, my darling, well done. The author continues, we inhale each day throughout the entire day. Consider the powerful level of mindfulness we can access if even the simple act of breathing functions as a stimulus to accelerate our consciousness and bring us more serenity, love, knowledge, and bliss. Hmm? Furthermore, we can release all the negativity that we often carry around such as sadness, fears, phobias, and anxieties. Although they come upon us at times, we can in fact release them by accessing the love, serenity, knowledge, and bliss we can simultaneously release the unhealthy emotions. Mm -hmm. Think about that the next time you take a breath. What are you inhaling? What are you exhaling? Mm -hmm. Today, when I went out, I practiced mindful walking. I walked for hours. I passed many people and saw many things. I sometimes had to avoid the danger of cars, dogs, and obstacles on the road. Nevertheless, I felt that the sun was shining to infuse my body with dynamic energy and that the birds were chirping just to cheer me up and encourage me towards my destination. Later on, when I returned to the temple, I looked at your picture and saw you smile at me and say, well done, my darling. Well done. The author goes on. Just as we breathe every day, we also walk. 
However, these days we might spend more time in the car or at our desk instead of walking and even push buttons just to open the garage door. Hopefully, we can occasionally take advantage of walking, especially during this mechanized time, these mechanized times. When we do walk, we can turn it into a meditation to enchant the devotion. Hmm? Here's the consciousness. Where's your consciousness? What are you thinking of when you're walking? We can make it a devotional, meditational time. We can reflect on how the sun's rays rejuvenate the body and the consciousness. And the songs of the birds encourage us toward our destination. We can experience our environment in such a way that it becomes supportive to our devotion and our God consciousness. And I think I'm going to stop there. These are two wonderful exercises to practice for the week. Practicing mindful breathing. What goes in, what comes out. and to practice mindful walking. And see how aware and mindful you are of what's in your environment and what God is presenting to you in his beauty. How's that? So, are there any questions, any comments? Wonderful. Practice, I feel... You know, if you read the purports for these Bhagavad Gita verses and uh, practice these two steps before we go further and see, does it make a difference in your life? I'm sure it will. Any questions, any comments? Yes. What's the difference between being mindful and, and mental or self-absorbed? The mindful is completely focused on Krishna. The other you just mentioned, self-absorbed, what else? Mental. Just being mental. Mental means you're allowing the mind to control you. And the mind can bring in so much nonsense that if we don't get a hold of it and let it see there's something else that we're focusing on besides that nonsense, then we can go into all confusion. That's what he's saying. That's what's so exciting here. He's quoting from Krishna. I mean, if you see the sunlight, you want to stop being mental. What can the mind say about the sun? It's too hot. It's not, you know, but if it's Krishna's eye or Krishna created it or the birds are singing this is all he's the cause of all causes our minds begin to go to a higher taste if you will yeah don't let that that mind control you that's so what a good write-up he gives us in the 12 qualities of how to control the mind did that answer Yes, it's a different. There's another question. Is mindful breathing a way to keep out mind, keep our mind on what we want to achieve? Is mindful breathing well? If you're knowing that the breath you're taking in is all God's energy, and God's energy includes the intelligence of how to do things, and it's the knowledge he's told us here, he's in our hearts, he's everything for us, then we're using that mindfulness for whatever we're doing. That's what I found out the next few days after last week's class. There were things I had to do, but somehow it's hard to even describe how, based on what we had read that was Friday night, 
I somehow was able to not become distressed by it or overly anxious about it. It was like, all right, Krishna, you know I need to do this. And I went on and did it. And I tell you, when one thing I had to do some writing for, of course, I was taking online. When I realized that I was finished and I, was, I wasn't in an anxious state, part of me felt I, it wasn't good enough, if you will, but it was okay. I felt I, so I, I had help with it. So that was the mindfulness that I had help, that the Lord was there with me. He knew what I needed to do and would help me. So just hearing the descriptions of who the Lord is, what his qualities are, and know that we have those qualities in small quantity, then you're, you're raising yourself. I don't know, does that answer who asked that, Carol? Does that help, Carol? And just breathe, you gotta breathe. So just take what he said and re breathe in. I remember we used to, what was that an exercise in school? Breathe in the good and breathe out the bad. Somewhere we did that in, in a school exercise or a gym exercise or something. And that's what he's saying. When he inhaled, he imagined drawing in love, serenity, knowledge, and bliss. These are all qualities of the Lord. So you can't go wrong. And the more you do that, the more the mind will stop its nonsense and accept that, yeah, I think so, I better get out the way. Yeah, yeah, you just have to be mindful. I don't know, I hope that helps. Okay, any other comments, questions? Anybody else came on? Carol. I'm so glad you're there, Carol, and you're really paying attention. You're really striving for spiritual growth. It's so wonderful. Okay. That's it. Okay, so we'll say, Hare Krishna, have a blessed week. You've got nice assignments that can lift your consciousness, touch your heart, and you'll come back and help me with class next week. Okay, Hare Krishna.